purpose of God's creation. And in order to do that, first I would like to read a brief passage from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus from the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 8, where Paul writes these words. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Can we pray? Our Father and our God, when we contemplate the question, why did you create this earth in the first place? And to what end have you ordained it? For what purpose have you sustained it and appointed it? And we ask that as we think of these things, not from the perspective of this world, but from the perspective of your Word, you will grant us understanding, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Very early in our conference, Dr. Moeller made reference to the 1980 introduction of the television series called Cosmos that was hosted by Carl Sagan and then the subsequent book from the same title in which on the very first page Sagan made the assertion that the cosmos as we examine it now is all that there is, all that there ever was, and all that there ever will be. But what few of us remember was that almost 20 years before that assertion by Carl Sagan, a little book was released that had been written by a Harvard professor that was entitled, The Secular City, a title taking off from the classical work of St. Augustine called the city of God. And in that little book written by Harvey Cox, Cox gave a theological slash sociological analysis of the state of American culture. And what he described in this book was a process that had begun earlier that he defined as the secularization of America. And he further defined that idea of secularization as the liberation of the culture from the dominance of metaphysical and religious principles. Now, I'd just like to take a moment to give further explanation to what that secularization involved. In the definitions of it, Cox pointed out that in the Latin language there were two distinct words, both of which can be and have been translated into the English language by the word world. The first Latin word for world was the word mundus, from which the famous epithet that we've heard from Dr. Godfrey with respect to St. Athanasius, where it was said of him, Athanasius contra mundum. Now, that is Athanasius against the world. But the word mundus, the root there, 
refers to this world in spatial categories, meaning this place, the here of this world or of this universe, as differentiated from the out there or up there of the heavenly world. That the other word for world, besides the word mundus, is the word saculum. And the term saculum is also translated by the English word world, but it refers not so much to this world as this local place, but rather to this world from a time perspective, meaning this time. The hick and the nunc, the here and the now, as being distinguished from the eternal. Now, herein is the collision of worldviews. What secularism does is interprets all of reality in terms of the now, the world in this time. And before Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is, all there was, ever will be, the secularist was saying, this time is all there is. There is no eternity. Now, do you see the conflict? Because all of biblical truth is given by what the philosophers call truth that is subspecies eternitatis, that is, under the auspices or from the perspective of the eternal. So when you get the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there a world in the first place? And what is the destiny of the world in the future? You're going to get two radically different answers if you look at the question simply through the eyes of secularism or through the eyes of the eternal. And therein is the difference. In the world in which we are called to live in Christ and this passing world in which we are called to minister. This world that is passing away. I don't know who it was, one of the early speakers, it may have been Al, who talked about one of the dilemmas of modern naturalism following the course of macroevolution to discover what they were looking for as the alpha principle. I was in conversation with Carl Sagan several years ago, of course, before he died, and we were talking about the <laughs> opening seconds. Yeah, I don't involve myself in necromancy. <laughs> And his uh, appreciation of Big Bang cosmology and said that science can now take us back to a nanosecond after the Big Bang. And, and I asked him a simple question. It was a simple question. I said, if, if all of matter and energy were compressed into this infinitesimal point of singularity that was in a state of organization, and inertia for eternity, then why was it that on one Thursday afternoon at three o'clock, the whole thing blew up and exploded into our present universe? I said the most fundamental definition of inertia is bodies that are at rest tend to remain at rest unless they're acted on by an outside force. And those things that are in motion tend to remain in motion, like golf balls, until they are acted on by an outside force, forces of friction and that sort of thing. 
And so I said to Sagan, I said, what's the outside force here that created this enormous change in all of reality that had been inert for eternity? And his simple and profound answer was, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I said, how can you be a scientist and stop because you want to stop and instead of pushing for truth? You see, they needed an alpha point, a beginning point that would make sense of the whole process. Now, here's the problem with macroevolution that assumes movement, a dynamic, always from the simple to the complex, from the single cell to the most complex designed organisms that would come later. And the idea, going back to social Darwinianism with Spencer and others, was that there is this movement of history and of time from an alpha point to an omega point. And one of the other problems that we face today, once we embrace secularism, is there's no possibility of an omega point. There's no possibility of an alpha point. We start with nothing, and we end with nothing, and we say all there is is this time now between those two poles of nothing and nothing. And I've been screaming for decades that if we start with nothing and if we end with nothing, we are nothing. Albert Camus understood that when he said, in light of this worldview, which is really the worldview of nihilism, the only philosophical question left to ask is the question of suicide. Now, over against secularism, there is a view that we've been exploring that has an alpha and has an omega. And not only an alpha and an omega, but the alpha and the omega. And that's okay, I'll wait. Is that all? There you go. Now that is not embarrassing because that applause is for Jesus who's the Alpha and the Omega. Now, at St. Andrews, in addition to the Sunday morning worship services, we have once a month a midweek teaching service on Wednesday nights. And for the past year or so, I've been speaking through Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And in our most recent gathering, I had to lecture on the text that I just read for you this morning from chapter 4, where Paul says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, and so on. And as we explored that text together, I found myself unusually intimidated by the text. I said, there's so much here that I can't grasp. It's too high. It's too holy. It's too wonderful for my mind to fathom and made me think of Calvin's axiom, finitum non capax infinitum. The finite cannot 
comprehend the infinite. Oh, I think I could understand part of the text. And that's where I spent most of my time in my lecture. The earlier part of the text where Paul said that when he, that is Jesus, ascended on high, he led captivity captive, or other translations read, he led a host of captives. Now that's somewhat startling because when we get the gospel record and the record of the book of Acts by Luke of the bodily ascension of Jesus into heaven, you remember they went out from the city there to the Mount of Ascension, and suddenly the Shekinah cloud came and enveloped Jesus, and He began to rise into the heavens. And the disciples were enraptured by this vision, and they just fixed their gaze on the glory cloud, taking their Lord to His coronation. And the angel came and said to the men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into heaven? Do you not know that this one who has been lifted up will, in the same manner in which he has departed, return in clouds of glory? Now, what did they see on the Mount of Ascension? They saw the glory, and they saw Jesus. But those who were standing there watching the ascension of Jesus, I'm sure, did not see an entourage accompanying Him on His ascension into heaven. But yet here Paul is saying that when He ascended, He didn't send alone but he was leading captivity captive, that in his trail, in his wake, as he rose to the right hand of God, were captives that he had conquered. And the principal captives that were in that entourage were not the kings and rulers of this world. So much as it was the powers and principalities of evil. They came in chains behind him. I don't know who all was in that group, but I know among them was a serpent with a crushed head who was now a captive of the triumphant Jesus. Paul, of course, was merely looking back to the Old Testament, to the Psalm of David, Psalm 68, where the psalmist in verse 16 writes these words, why do you look with hatred, O many-peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for His abode? Why do the rest of you mountains here in this world look with envy, jealousy, hostility at the mountain God has chosen to be His home? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. For the chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands, and the Lord is among them, and Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, said the psalmist leading a host of captives in your train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious. 
that the Lord God may dwell there. Here, the psalmist in the Old Testament is celebrating the ascension of God to His throne at Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Yahweh, who has slain the kings of this earth, who had set themselves against Him, who had taken counsel together against Him and against His Messiah, saying, let us cast their cords from us. That God had held them in derision and not only defeated them and captured them, but He led them in captivity to His holy mountain and he received gifts from them. That's the little tiny twist that Paul makes between the psalm and, and his epistle where he mentions, this quotes the psalm, where in the psalm, Yahweh in his victory ascent receives tribute from his defeated enemies. Paul emphasizes in the ascension of Jesus not what Jesus gets from his enemies, but what He gives to His people. There's no contradiction there. It's different, different emphasis, because in this whole metaphor, this whole imagery, imagery of leading captives in captivity, that in the ancient world, when you captured your enemy, you received tribute from them. And you took that tribute then and distributed to your people which is a wonderful motif we find in the New Testament, that all of the tribute that Christ receives, He will distribute to us in His mercy and in His grace. But this is the part of the text that I said isn't all that hard. It's what comes later, where we read in, in saying He ascended, what does it mean, but that He also descended into the lower regions to the earth. Jesus Himself was quoted in John's Gospel, no one ascends into heaven who is not first descended from heaven. We heard a wonderful exposition of Philippians 2 during this conference, how Christ took His glory and His position in heaven, not as a thing to be grasped, as to be jealously guarded, but He will it, laid it aside became a slave, obedient, even unto death. No one ascends into heaven except the one who descends. Now, other people went up to heaven, Elisha, I mean Elijah, and Enoch. But when Jesus said no one ascends, He doesn't mean no one else ever went up there. He means no one ever went there for this reason, to be coronated, to be crowned, to be invested to be seated at the right hand of God. And then we've heard on several occasions in this conference, Jesus' words in John 16, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now we sometimes, in our distress, living in a society that becomes increasingly more hostile towards us, our prayer is, O oh Lord, may You prevail and may You overcome this hostile environment when You come back in glory. The overcoming of this world is not a future event. It's a past event. Jesus said, be of good cheer because someday I'm going to overcome the world? No. Be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And so Paul goes on here and he says, He who has descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And that's when I choked. What? Why did He ascend above all the heavens? Why did He leave captivity captive? 
Why did he overcome the world? And the answer that the apostle gives us here is that he might fill all things, which he does now. Fill all things. Now, on my Wednesday night message, I spent about 20 seconds on that phrase, that he might fill all things, and then ran as fast as I could to the next line. Because here, as I say, is where I choke. What in the world does Paul mean here when he says that Jesus ascended to fill all things? Well, the first thing we think about in his filling all things is that in his divine nature, he shares with the Father and with the Holy Spirit the principle of immensity, of ubiquity, of infinity, that there is no place in heaven and earth where God in his deity is not present, that God fills all things, first of all, with His being. Nothing can be anywhere except as it is in God. Now here we have to not only be careful, we have to be super careful because this brings us so close to the edge of pantheism that confuses the Creator and the creature and said everything in the universe is God. All is God, God is all, which is a wicked and pernicious blasphemy. It's the very essence of idolatry when you identify the creation or part of the creation with the very being of God. Like the ancient idolaters would worship the storm, the storm god or the sun god. No, in biblical categories, God was in the storm. But God was not the storm. God was in the wind, but God was not the wind. God is in the sun, which cannot shine for a second apart from the power of God, but God is not the sun. We must never, ever obliterate the distinction between the Creator and the creature, yet nothing can exist unless it subsists in the very being of God and is filled by God. And touching His divine nature, there is no particle in this universe in which Jesus is not present. He fills it all. The clouds, the flowers, the animals, the stones, the buildings. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And the whole world is full of His glory. And there is our sin. As Calvin said, we are, as it were, people who walk through this majestic theater where every part is displaying the beauty of His holiness of His majesty, but we walk, as it were, with men wearing blindfolds that are willfully put there. It's 
so that we may cover our eyes and hide ourselves from His glory. Oh, I know sometimes we'll go and we'll look at a beautiful sunset and, or go to the Grand Canyon and say, oh, here we see a little mini portrait of the beauty of holiness and of God's glory. But it's not just in the sunset. It's in everything. The whole world is filled with His glory. And we walk through it and we don't see it. Not because He's hiding, but because we're hiding. Hiding our eyes from the glory imparted into our Father's world and displayed by our Father's world. The glory is there, filled by the glory of Jesus. But not only does He fill the world in His essence, deity, but He fills the world with His authority and His sovereignty. He rules over every rock and over every tree, not because simply He's in every rock and every tree. but principally because He made every rock and every tree. We see in the Scriptures that creation itself is a triune activity, but the principal actor of creation is the Son by whom and through whom all things are made. And now, we see that Jesus not only fills everything, Jesus not only owns everything, Jesus not only rules over everything, but everything that is there is for Him. Let me just skip over for just a second to another letter of Paul to the Colossians where he says in the very first chapter, beginning at verse 15, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created. Notice the preposition. By Him, by the means of His creative power, all things were created in heaven and in earth. There are creatures in heaven, there are angels, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through Him. Now here's the kicker. And the answer to the question to which I've been assigned, and for Him. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why does this world exist? Why do you exist? For Jesus. That's our raison d'etre. That's our reason for being. That's why anything is, is for Him, that He may be all in all and share His glory with no man. Finally, before Harvey Cox wrote his book in the early 60s, another book was written, a very small book that didn't have nearly the wide distribution or fame associated with it. In fact, I'd like to make a confession to you <clears throat> and see if you have the same kind of problems I have. I can't remember the title of the book. <laughs> and what's worse, 
I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it. <laughs> Have you ever had that problem? Say, I read somewhere. I don't remember where it was. I don't know who wrote it. I don't know who said it. I don't know the name of the book. Do you have that? I go nuts when I get inquiries from publishers where I've, I've quoted something from Luther or Calvin, and they say, you didn't give a source for that. And I write back, and I say, do you know how many pages of John Calvin I've read in my lifetime, or Martin Luther, and you expect me to remember where? I don't know. I don't know where he said that. But I know that he said it. <laughs> and again, this little book gave a new twist to understanding Genesis 1, where he talked about the six days of creation and seeing the culmination in creation in the sixth day with the creation of man, male and female in the image of God. And then he goes on to say in Hebrew numerology, the number six is not ultimate. It's penultimate. In fact, if you take the number six and raise it to the third degree, what do you get? Six, six, six. The ultimacy of imperfection and of evil. But the sacred number is seven. So if you want to look at the goal of creation, you can't stop at chapter six or day six, you go to day seven. That's the day God blessed. That's the day God hallowed. On the seventh day, He rested, and He hallowed that day. He made it holy not just at the end of the seven days of creation, but forever, imparting a cyclical pattern of living in this world and in this time and these days, that at the end of that cycle each week would point towards our eternal destiny, our entering into our heavenly Sabbath our Sabbath rest. And so the author of this little book said, the goal of creation is Sabbath holiness, which means the goal of creation is resting in the fullness of Christ. Christ is the alpha of creation. Christ is the omega of creation. And the only reason you exist and that I exist is for Him. For to live is Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us to grasp even a little bit how You have filled the glory of Your creation with Jesus. Help us to rejoice in His ascension and in the fullness of the One by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were made.